Do you have any audio in your presentation? No. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Hey, Jerry. Hi. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Jerry nice Martin. Nice to meet you as well. I'm Actually, the, uh, looks super familiar. I think you did one of our events, the Union Innovation Challenge a couple years ago. Probably. The big auditorium. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm the AV coordinator here, so for, for the moment. We'll hopefully have a new person shortly. We saw your slides. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah. Great job. Uh, well, yeah, these are the intro, intro slides, but the you know, ones we actually put on the door from the day of the down. Yeah. yeah. Did you need anything? The only thing that we don't have on there, and we can either do it in the intro or we can do it in the uh, in my slides, is the. Uh, Um, the details on the on the pitch, but you have that. Yeah, I've I've got a, a brief one there. Um, where it is, yeah. what time, prizes, yeah. and and then a little intro on the judges. Yeah. All right, Jerry, I'm ready for to be flung up there. You can take the exchange oh, out too if you want to, Rob, on mine. Oh, okay. Right, let me get you a clicker real quick. All right. So you want to walk around while you're talking, or? Uh, you, you can mic me up. Okay, cool. That's what I wanted to make sure. This in your Turning that way, so yeah, right here. All right, go ahead and give it a test. One, two, three. Perfect. Okay. There's your clicker. So we are. How, how do I turn them off for the interim? Oh, um. Okay. Right, clicker's working.
Uh, yeah, there. I so I've sent Linda across there to um, bring bring any any ones that turned up in the Bronx suite over, and I talked to one or two coming over, and they they said yeah, they um, one of them will put a, a note in the, the chat room, and so I think they're uh, on course to 34. We brought over 24, so there's about 10 of them here. Right. So a few, a few stragglers. Who am I seeing that I recognize? You know, I, I, I know very few people in the class, so... We're only missing about five. Let me send you this. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes, but just by show of hands, how many, uh, who are the folks from uh, Pamphlet and from College of Engineering and TVMH? 
man, see, the reason I ask is like, I want to see where people distribute themselves. <laughs> and I was really disappointed in the TV main students because you guys always sit up front. And there you are, slinking in the back. <laughs> Somewhat distributed. But uh, we'll, um, we'll announce the teams at the end of today's session so that you guys, uh, what I would suggest is that you, you know, we have like a brief uh, uh, greet at the end. And uh, if you guys want to redistribute yourselves on the van so that you can start talking amongst your teams on the way back, I think that would probably be a good idea. Um, I think you're going to need to make use of every bit of waiting time that you've got between now and Wednesday morning when your private concept is due. So we'll get started in just a minute. We're ready now. Uh, And um, welcome to the uh, the TBMH um, pamphlet and Beam uh, VT Biomedical <laughs> Innovation course. Uh, you can't break it down to a single acronym, unfortunately. But um, here are the course organisers. Our names are up there, um, and also email contacts if um, um, any of you need to get in touch with us. Um, and so the purpose of the teaching block will be to introduce you all as a group um, to the process of biomedical translation and commercialization. So it's a two week block, although just the first two days will be devoted to um, didactic lecturing. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a collaboration between um, various Virginia Tech entities, including the Translational Biology, Medicine and Health graduate program here at VT, um, the Pamphlin School of Business and Apex Innovation Center um, and the College of Engineering, uh, and specifically the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Mechanics. So there are 48 of you. Um, you can see that the BEAM students are um, majority, um, and probably all aware, um, you'll all be mixed up into um, teams um, to build your business competition pitch around. All right, so the didactic lectures will be, um, won't be traditional lectures, they'll be rather short. Um, we'll be having people popping in and out. Um, they'll be rapid fire and they'll cover topics such as um, intellectual property, um, federal drug administration regulatory concerns, um, clinical trials, entrepreneurship, morning David, uh, translational research and development, company startup and investment. Um, we're going to try and teach to the test, and of course the test will be the pitch competition. So as much as possible, the kinds of information that we'll be giving you will be the sorts of information that will allow you to put your seven minute um, pitch together, um, which will be the culmination of the course on um, November 17th. And it, as you can see, um, most of the content will be taught by Mark, um, Derek, and myself. Uh, Rob Gordy, but we'll also have um, some contributions from um, an IP attorney, Ford Kemper of Woods Rogers, um, and a venture capitalist, um, James Ramey, um, who is a principal at uh, the VTC um, Innovation Fund, which is a, a local um, a, a venture capital fund. Now, you'll be divided amongst eight teams. And within those teams, we've tried as much as possible to um, have a balanced mixture of students from the, the three disciplines. Um, the intellectual property that you'll be working with will be from the Tier 1 research universities within Virginia. Um, Mark, Derek and, I, Derek and I have scoured Virginia for intellectual property at uh, research institutions that uh, your teams will work with. Each team will get three pieces of intellectual property and um, what you'll do is look at that intellectual property and amongst you figure out which is the one you want to build your pitch around um, and discard the other two. 
um, pieces of intellectual property. And probably also, if you decide that you don't want to use any of the three pieces of intellectual property, we'll open up any IP that was um, discarded by the other teams for you to have a look at, just just to make certain that you know you have as much opportunity to um, have a have a look at a patent or an invention that um, the, the team is happy with. The key thing here will be um, to make your choices quickly because you know you need to get on with the the process of getting organised and starting to to think about um, um, how you're going to build the um, the competition pitch. Okay, so um, we're going to try and simulate aspects of the licensing process. So very helpful to us um, in the um, development of the intellectual property that we're curating have been the intellectual property offices at Virginia Tech, um, uh, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, um, and also the University of Virginia and George Mason University. Um, these offices act as repositories and also um, try and uh, undertake business development of the, intellectual, of, of the university's intellectual property. So once you um, have chosen your piece of IP, um, one good thing to do would be, for example, to get in contact with the office and um, uh, see what further information you can get out of them. Um, the, the actual patent itself and also uh, other d documentation um, associated with the, with the intellectual property will be available to you um, and it should be available via clickable links, I think Mark is it, um, in, the, in, in the three files that you'll be given. But you might also um, press the intellectual property office for further information, maybe even get in contact with the, the inventor at the university and start a conversation with them um, about their own ideas for development of their, their IP. Um, and each team will be um, assigned um, an experienced top tech entrepreneur. Um, um, and that one of you was left over from a slide I used last week um, when we were actually talking to our um, team mentors. And here are the team mentors. Um, you probably won't be familiar with them at this stage, but tomorrow um, at the end of the lecture they'll join um, the class. Um, and we'll have, um, uh, we'll have a breakout where each of the teams will get with their mentors, have a meet and greet. Um, uh, the Apex Centre for Innovation, um, um, i.e. Derek, has kindly laid on lunch, so um, your care and feeding will be seen to during that, that process. So that will happen uh, 11 to noon tomorrow. Okay, so just, just a few things, and this probably reflects my own anxieties more than anything. Um, you know, you guys probably don't have a great deal to do with each other in your lives as students at Virginia Tech. Um, you come from different um, teaching cultures. Um, you probably have different career aspirations. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is simulate the sorts of teams that might be put together um, in the world outside of work, where engineers and scientists and business professionals have to work together around a project. Um, you know, it's, it's cool in concept, but we also understand that um, it, uh, you know, it carries certain risks as well. So, you know, communication and patience with each other um, um, are going to be important, I think. Um, we anticipate that distance will be an issue, the distance between Roanoke and, and Blacksburg. So you're going to need to be proactive um, in cooperating with each other and using whatever means at your disposal to um, um, reach out, Skype, telephone, um, even agreed meeting places to get together and um, um, divide up the work of getting ready for the pitch, uh, organising the pitch and making it as successful as you possibly can. And a sense of humour might be helpful. Um, this is one of my favourite cartoons from Gary Larson. Um, the top uh, provides a, um, um, how a scientist might deal with a runaway stagecoach, um, the business professional, um, but of course we can't forget the engineers as well um, um, and their attempt to deal with runaway stagecoaches. So um, at this point I'm going to hand it over to Mark who will um, take you through the next few stages. Give me just a quick second here to swap out the computers. Rob, I'm going to give you this back. Oh, do you want the... Uh, 
I've got I've got that first slide on this deck. Yeah, I've got the uh, microphone here because everyone's here. But I'm whispering to Derek. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't know if I'll need this. I'll probably stay behind the podium. One thing is, Mark, it's set up. Please be interactive, and as I imagine, all of you are going to have lots and lots of questions. So feel free to start firing those questions as we go along. And if they're going to be covered in the slides, we'll do it. Um, we'll tell you the powers, but uh, not in the Yeah, I just want to reiterate a couple of things. Um, as Rob said, there really are no limits on this. It's not like a prelim exam or a test in one of your classes. It's wide open. So he said you can contact the inventors. I would write that down. I would make special note of that. I would hunt the inventors down. Um, I also, if I have anxiety about anything, it's about getting through the next 48 hours and you guys picking your product concepts and looking at that intellectual property. We realize folks haven't had a lot of, of experience in this. Um, and if that freezes you, freezes your team, you will be stuck. Um, you really need to get the product concept and the IP piece of it down. Um, and I think in, in a lot of cases, the inventors will be, um, will be very helpful. I hope that they are. Another thing that I would throw out is that if at any point in the process you get stuck, you have questions, things aren't working, uh, if a faculty inventor will not respond to your emails, those sorts of things, let us know and let us see what we can do about that. Because um, uh, if I were on one of your teams, I would consider it very, very important to be able to talk to um, the inventor. Um, all right, so let me make sure this is up. And if you have questions during this, I'm just going to run through a couple of things real quick and then. Um, I have the uh, dubious task of getting you guys all excited about regulatory and FDA. Um, so we'll get into that in just a second. But just a couple things, you know, to, to reiterate what Rob said. Um, this is very unusual. And, and I said when I was going around, mostly in Blacksburg, pitching to the College of Engineering students, I said, I'll go out on a limb and I will say that this will probably be one of the most interesting, enlightening educational experiences that you'll have at your time in Virginia Tech. So I want you to hold me to that. If after this, that didn't happen for you, I want to hear about that. If it did happen for you, I'd like to hear about that as well. Uh, but this is kind of an experiment, and, and you guys are the test subjects. Um, and so hopefully this will work out, but I think it's going to work out if we all uh, maintain a sense of humor. Um, we stay in close communication if things aren't working. This is very different than your typical classroom uh, experience or um, you know, qualifying exams and things like that. We want you to be engaged. We want you to ask questions. And in the real world, you won't have artificial limits. You'll be able to talk to anybody if, uh, as long as they'll talk to you. You'll be able to go wherever you can go and get resources. And we want you to sort of exercise that approach. Um, and Rob mentioned the rest. So I'm going to jump into the regulatory stuff. Okay? How many have heard anything about FDA or the regulatory process that uh, stands between innovation or, or discovery and the practice of medicine? A few. All right, that's good. That's more than I thought um, we would run into. So um, again, all the slides will be up um, if they aren't immediately. Uh, just be patient. They'll be up by the, um, by certainly by tonight. One thing I would say about my slides, probably true for these guys as well, I've got a lot of hyperlinks in here. We're going to give you a basic amount of information and then we're going to point you to a lot of other stuff. And you guys are going to have to figure out how to assimilate all of that other stuff. So if anything on Canvas isn't working, if any of the hyperlinks in my presentation aren't working, let me know. All right? To start with, here's a few videos that might be helpful to you. I understand uh, from so students who have looked at these before, one of the videos may have disappeared. Hopefully it's back. But if you know nothing about the Food and Drug Administration, I would start here. Go to the FDA website and uh, this hyperlink at the top and watch these videos. It is literally FDA 101. It tells you the basic structure of the Food and Drug Administration um, and how they do business. And so one of the reasons why this is important and why you need to assimilate this into your plans is because the regulatory process will drive a lot of timeline and costs 
uh, um, items. And so as you're putting together your pitch and you're thinking about your uh, cash flow projections and your timelines, you'll have to take into account the regulatory process because nobody gets to go and sell a product legally in the marketplace unless and until they deal with uh, the laws that we have on the books, and that is the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and dealing with the regulatory agents that are, that are charged with enforcing that, which is in the U.S. is the uh, Food and Drug Administration. Now, due to time, I'm only going to cover U.S. FDA, okay? But you may, in your strategy, you may decide that you want to go outside the U.S. to launch your product. That's perfectly okay, but then it's up to you to figure out you know, what are the requirements in the European Union? What are the requirements in Japan, Australia? If that's what you're going to do. So if you're going to pursue an outside U.S. or OUS strategy, then you've got to look at those. They're going to pretty much follow the FDA, so this will, all, this will all be relevant. But I don't want you to, again, be constrained by any of this. You can follow an OUS um, launch if you want to. But if you know nothing, I would start with these videos. They're about 40, 45 minutes a piece or so. Yeah. Some of the folks that have I've already seen them from some of my other classes. Okay, so what we're dealing with is the U.S. Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act (FDCA), and it says that no person can introduce a medical product into interstate commerce without prior approval. It sounds really simple. That's basically what the law says. And because of that law, and because you can't do this until you get this prior approval, that's where all of the process comes in. That's where all the time and expense comes in because it's that prior approval where you have to dig into the regulations and figure out how do you get approval. And the Food and Drug Administration does a very good job of letting people know, people, companies, investigators know and understand what it is that they need to do uh, for a particular product. And so uh, the challenge there is that there's a ton of information there because they try to be all things to all people. And so the FDA web pages are a great source of information, but it is literally a labyrinth in which you can be lost forever and starve to death. So I've got hyperlinks in here to kind of point you to the most essential elements. And as Rob said, we're going to try to kind of teach to the test. So recognize that there's a whole ton of stuff out there under this concept of prior approval and the things that you have to do in order to get to the point where you can engage in interstate commerce in the United States with your product, okay? So the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is a federal law, all right? I'm going to talk about what that means and what's a law versus a regulation versus a guidance document, which ones do you have to pay attention to, and which ones are the parts where you can pull out information that will help you do the things you have to do for this pitch competition, which is identify the particular steps, the particular tests that you have to do, how long do they take, and how much are they going to cost, because that's what you're going to have to build into your model. So the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act has a whole bunch of things associated with it, as the name suggests. There's some things in there that aren't in the name, like tobacco products, for example. But we're going to focus on things like uh, drugs and devices. I think in most cases, you guys are probably going to gravitate toward um, either a drug, a biologic, or a device. Um, why this might be relevant is because you're going to have to engage in a, a large degree of self-teaching in these two weeks. We're not going to be able to tell you everything. So I want to give you resources and some basic understanding. So if, there's, if you have a question, I would prefer you, uh, you know, try to dig it, uh, dig it out on your own rather than come to us for everything. Try to find the answer yourselves first. So you actually can go into the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act online and look at things and get uh, a lot of um, useful information for this exercise. For example, here is part of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And the way that the laws in the U.S. are organized is they are part of United States Code, or USC. And the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is part of Title 21 of the U.S. Code, Section 355. So when you're doing uh, literature, when you're doing searches on Google and you're trying to find information, those things are important to use as keywords to try to find the places that you need to go. 21 U.S.C. 355. If I put that into the Google, as I call it, um, that will take you to Section 355. So that's just kind of shorthand. Um, 
And this is important because, and I don't expect you to read this, and I'm not going to read it to you, but later on, you may need to, to get some pieces of U.S. code to understand what it is that you have to do, a test that you might have to do, or some other element that might contribute to timeline and cost. So just know that it's in there, and you can go in and search the U.S. code. I'll give you some, there's some links in here where you can go in where it's a little bit more efficient. You don't have to resort to Google. Um, you can actually go into government websites and then get you a little closer so that your searches are a little bit more relevant. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of information, and the key there is to know what you're searching for and try to get just to that rather than all of the, the other superficial information. Okay? So we have U.S. law. That's U.S. code. The way that this works in the federal government is that Congress makes up the law, the executive branch signs off on the law, and then that law goes to the relevant agency. That law, if it has to do with the Department of Defense, it goes over to the Department of Defense. It has to go to the Department of Commerce, it goes to them. If it has to do with food, drugs, tobacco products, those sorts of things, that's the purview of the US FDA. So that law then, or changes to that law, would then go to the agency that's the most relevant and then that agency issues regulations. And what that is, is a step in the process of going from the law to the people who understand what that law means to their agency and interpreting that law and applying that law and coming up with regulations. So we go from something that can be somewhat nonspecific because it's written by congressional uh, aides and pushed through by uh, congressional representatives and then it's voted on and passed, you can imagine that that is somewhat broad and general. Once it gets to the individual agencies and it gets interpreted and it becomes a regulation, it gets more specific. So USC may not be all that relevant for you. You may spend a little time looking at some of the relevant uh, parts of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. But by and large, the things that are going to drive cost and timeline are going to be found in the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR. And there's a really nice website called the eCFR, Electronic CFR, so there's a hyperlink there, where you can go in and you'll get a lot more specific information about what regulatory processes, steps, information that one has to provide in order to work through this prior approval process. So again, just like USC, we have CFR, Code of Federal Regulations. And again, titles, and uh, chapters and subchapters. So if you're searching, you can search by keywords like 21 CFR 855, and it'll take you to section 855 of 21 CFR. So don't confuse USC and CFR. CFR is, is the next step in the process and probably be more specific um, and more relevant. Okay? So here's an example of what's in the CFR. Uh, the reason I put this up is because this talks about an IND, which is an investigative new drug. So the way that we, the way that the process works is we have this law that says that you can't engage in interstate commerce. I can't sell a product to a hospital and have them use it in a patient if I haven't gone through that prior approval process. Similarly, I can't give a medical product to a clinician and have them test it on somebody. That's also illegal, okay? If it's not, if I don't have that prior approval, you're not allowed to use humans as guinea pigs. So you can't just like make something in your garage or mix up some chemicals in your bathtub and then go take it down to your local clinic and test it on people. That's illegal and you'll go to jail for that. So the way that we sort of house that human investigation legally is you get an exemption or you get an exception to the law. And the way that you do that is you get what's called an IND, an Investigative New Drug uh, Application Approved by FDA, or an IDE, an Investigative Device Exemption. Okay, so there'll be these acronyms, um, and I'll, I'll try not to, if I use one and I didn't explain it, then just raise your hand. Um, and then there's also a third one called um, a biologics license application, or BLA. So depending on what kind of product you have, a device, classical kind of drug compound, or what's rolled into biologics, which is more human-derived, tissue, uh, blood products, those sorts of things, um, you'll have to fill out an application and submit it to the FDA. And then that puts you in a bubble where you can do human investigation 
prior to having that prior approval. So it's a it's it's a, a point in time where you're still figuring out does your stuff work, is it safe, before you go on to the market and it accepts you from federal law. So you're not breaking federal law so long as you're under an IMD, IDE, or BLA. Now, as you can imagine, you don't just fill out a one-page form and send it into the FDA and say, I have this uh, brand new chemical compound and I want to go test it in humans. You have to provide a lot of information first before you're allowed to go ahead and set up and run a clinical study. So first off, they want to know what you've done to show that you're ready to make the transition to human clinical studies. And that involves a lot of laboratory research, bench research, uh, physical properties testing, characterization of your material, understanding your manufacturing process and locking that down so that you've got a well-controlled manufacturing process wherein you can produce the same product every single time. Make a million units, have less than one unit in a million that's defective, those sorts of things. Um, and then you have to test that in accept scientifically acceptable model systems. Some of those may be bench tests, some of those may be animal studies. You provide all of that information in your application package. And the Food and Drug Administration looks at all of that and says, okay, there's sufficient information here to, to demonstrate that this is going to be safe when we, as we transition from animals to humans, and so we will allow a clinical study. Let's look at that clinical study design, see what that looks like, and get our input into that, and then once we come to an agreement as to what that's going to be, then we issue the IND, IDE, BLA, and then that company or entity can then go off and do their clinical testing. We're going to monitor it along the way. You don't just get a free pass and you go off and disappear for three years. It's a very, very tightly controlled process. So everything that I've just spurted out here it has cost and timeline elements associated with it. All of those tests are going to cost money and take time, and that's what you've got to build into your financial model. So Dr. Grady is going to talk about an R&D plan, um, and he's going to mention a lot of those things. I'm going to go brief through them briefly from a regulatory standpoint. So this is the basic concept. We have laws. The laws get interpreted by the agencies, and the regulations get created. Those regulations will also get refined and interpreted, and there's some additional information that you, you all are going to need. I'll show you what those are on the slides, where you can go in and get maybe a little bit more, even more specific information. So this is sort of general information down to very specific information. And in a lot of cases, you can actually get, if not a template, at least the components of what that application looks like that you could create a template. So you know almost to like check boxes of what are the actual things that you need to do. Now they won't tell you, you need to use this particular animal model and this dose and this time frame and you need to do these kinds of tests at the end to show us whether this worked or not. Uh, they, the, the regulations and even the guidance documents really speak more to the end goal, but industry, contract laboratories, other professionals have developed those tests, some of them are even uh, consensus standards that industry has developed that, that you'll be able to access. You'll be able to go in and see exactly. And the scientific literature is full of these sorts of things. And so, again, this is part of the, the uh, collaboration. If you've not done this before, um, the science students in particular, they ought to be very proficient at digging into the literature and finding things that can help you identify uh, cost and timeline sorts of elements. So what do you need to think about in terms of the FDA? It's actually pretty simple. They really care about three things, safety, efficacy, and um, your manufacturing process. And so all of this information that goes into your application really has to do in one way or another with these three things. But keep in mind that the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is set up so that we don't hurt people. We don't kill people with medical products. And so safety is always paramount. And there's always safety in everything, even when you're testing for efficacy, whether something actually works, is it beneficial, is it going to help people get better? There's still always a safety element there because exposing someone to surgery, to a medical device, exposing someone to a drug, it has inherent risks associated with, with it, not the least of which are that they're not going to be doing something else. If they choose your product, they're not using another product. So, FDA will look at this. They'll look at the other standards that are out there, what's going on in clinical practice, what other products are being uh, utilized by clinicians. And so it's not just a business consideration of how competitive is your product. Will, will 
hospital systems, will doctors buy it, will patients be happy with the outcome? FDA looks at that as well. If your product is not better, cheaper, faster, they consider that a, a safety issue because you're not using something that's a standard of care that's had a long history in the marketplace uh, that's been proven safe, and here's something new. It has to be better, cheaper, faster, or else you're exposing something, to somebody to some extra risk. Does that make sense? So just substituting one thing for another, the regulatory agencies can look at that as an element of risk. So everything is related to safety, but we kind of think of things in terms of safety, efficacy, and the manufacturing process. And these are things that are going to, again, affect um, cost and timeline. So how do they communicate to us what they care most about? How do people who've never done this before figure out what FDA cares about and what they need to do in their product development process? Well, they actually do a pretty good job of telling us what that is. Not in all cases, but if you happen to pick a product for which there are other products already on the marketplace, then there's probably going to be a lot of information out there. And there may be some very specific information in the form of what are called guidance documents. So once an area of medicine, an area of product development becomes popular um, because there's a big need, because there's a lot of companies that can engage in it because the IP space is open, because it's very lucrative, whatever the reasons, when it becomes popular, the agency goes through the process of putting together what's called a guidance document. Because there's enough people out there doing it, it's worth their time to put together a guidance document. So there's a hyperlink to guidance documents. That's one of the first things also that I would look for once you decide on a product. See if there's a guidance document for it. And just like the name says, it helps guide you through the process. It tells you the things that you need to do in order to get your IMD, IDE, or BLA. There's other things that would be helpful, probably not as helpful as guidance documents. The FDA does run, run a lot of conferences and workshops, and they publish papers. So if there's a specific issue that's come up in the industry, chances are they've addressed it somewhere, and there'll be more specific information where somebody's written a paper or given a talk or something like that, and you can get some information about the types of tests that one would need to do. Okay? So the pre-market testing that one needs to do can be divided into these uh, two broad categories and subcategories. You're basically looking at safety and efficacy. Now you're going to get questions from the judging panel about manufacturing as well, and you're going to have to lean on the engineering uh, students in your team, I think, to look at that and understand what sort of manufacturing process processes you might have available to you, and how do you ensure that you have a high level of quality control. Um, cost is going to be an issue, cost of goods sold, um, you're going to have to try to figure that out as well because that's going to have to go into your cost projections. But as far as the pre-market testing is concerned and the regulatory element of that, it's really broken into two broad categories, safety and efficacy. But again, remember, safety is part of everything, okay? Safety can be d divided into toxicology and pharmacology. Toxicology is, uh, if you have uh, any product, is going to have some sort of toxicity associated with it. Even natural products are going to have some sort of toxicity. They say you can drown in a tablespoon of water, right? So even though water is, is uh, you know, uh, life-sustaining, you can drown in water. Everything has a toxicity as associated with it, so you have to do some tox toxicity testing. Pharmacology is limited to drug and drug-like products. So anything that is uh, taken into the body and metabolized, you have to do pharmacology testing on it. Um, so your safety part of your pre-market testing, the stuff that you would put into your application, is going to deal with toxicology, pharmacology. Then the agency also wants to know, does it work? You want to know if it works. You want to know if you have a competitive advantage in the marketplace. And so you don't have to wait until human testing in order to determine that. You can set up some really nice translational uh, preclinical tests with animal models um, showing efficacy and comparing it to market-leading products, those sorts of things. So we're, we're, what we're expecting to see from this kind of composition of teams is fairly translational research plans where you're also gathering information that's important for things like uh, sales and marketing. Okay? Your efficacy tests are generally, by and large, they're going to be things like a pilot study in an animal model and what's called a pivotal animal study, which is the last animal study that you would do before you go into humans. As you would imagine, that pivotal animal study, the word pivotal means it's important, right? So it needs to be very, very close in 
how it simulates what is going to happen in the real world. So there's, if there's always a stretch from animals to human beings. Everybody accepts that. But there's bad animal models where you're just not getting the types of information that you need to get that are relevant for human beings. So pivotal animal studies have to contain as many elements of human clinical experience as you can get into that model. Um, and as, as you may imagine, those are going to be time-consuming, expensive studies. So they're going to add a lot to your R&D costs. But here's the basics. Okay, everybody has to kind of start with this. And so we will expect that from your plan, you will at least identify these types of tests and associate cost and timeline with those. Uh, I'm not going to go through these things for sake of time, but these are the sorts of things that you have to have information about before you go to the Food and Drug Administration. So once you get that basic testing, and you can go to the FDA Early. You don't have to be totally ready for your clinical study. You can go after some toxicity tests, maybe your first animal study, and talk to the FDA and get more information. That's always beneficial. And your mechanisms to go and interact with the agency, as I said, are the investigative uh, new drug application or investigative device exemption. They actually encourage people to have pre-meetings when they started gathering some of this information. So again, you can identify what is necessary for your IND, your investigative new drug, if you happen to have a drug product, or your IDE, if it's a medical device. And you can look in the CFR, and it'll tell you exactly what components of the data package, that application package, you have to have in order to get approval to do human clinical studies. So it's spelled out to you, literally, line by line, of what is necessary in your IND application, your IDE application. So these are things that you can identify as cost elements and then figure out how long they're going to take, how much are they going to cost, and then build those into your model for, for your, um, your cash flow analysis. Okay? Um, so there's IND, here's IDE, it's in a different section of the CFR. And again, you can find these things pretty quickly by searching the eCFR. Um, I've identified some other resources that I think would be helpful. Um, the toxicology, pharmacology, I know I need to, yeah, it won't flip, I need to escape from this. Um, the toxicology, pharmacology, gosh darn it, which direction do I need to drag here? Is it coming over? There it goes, okay. Sorry for that, my thing's not mirroring very well. Um, so here's a document that's provided by a company called Toxicon, which is a contract research lab. And it's called Medical Device Testing Guide. So what you can do is, again, hop on to Google. And um, because this is such a huge industry, billions and billions and billions of dollars, there's a pretty healthy contract laboratory um, contract research lab industry. And these tests are all identified, okay? This is a company, there's other companies out there that do this. Be assertive, be aggressive. Contact the companies and say, how much does it cost for this test, that test? They should be willing to give you that information, okay? And if you don't do that, you could be wildly off in your cost projections because I've asked my students in, in other classes what they think stuff like this cost. So to get to your first meeting with the, with the Food and Drug Administration, how much time, how much does that cost? Most people would think, because they hear about the exorbitant cost of developing a device or a drug, that it would be at least hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, to get to the point where you would have enough data to go and talk to the FDA. But you can get the initial toxicity test done for about $20,000 and it'd take about six months. And then you're in front of FDA and then you can get some guidance about your later animal studies. Okay, so um, I hope I can get this back. Is that going to work? Yes, okay. So there's a couple links in there to help you out with those. Um, I'm just going to end with um, this slide, some more information here. Um, a big, big, big chunk of your cost is going to be your clinical study. The preclinical stuff is actually peanuts compared to this, depending on what you're doing. Um, clinical trial costs can jump tenfold easily, hundredfold. 
Um, so here are some resources as well. That's going to be challenging for you. Clinical trial costs are hard to get to. Um, going to like a, uh, a per patient cost or a cost for the entire study. So one of the things as a strategy perhaps that one may use is look for a similar product, um, look for a similar clinical study, and you can do that on a site called clinicaltrials.gov. It's not going to give you a ton of information, but a basic clinical study design will be there. There's other things like uh, publications, Journal of American Medical Association, et cetera, where one can look and see what a clinical study design looks like. And then there are websites, sites like the Centers for Medicare uh, and Medicaid Services. They actually drive a lot of the ways in which um, products and services, the cost of products and services in the U.S. system are set. So you can dig into there. When you're standing in front of a judging panel and they're asking about your financial model, it's a very bad strategy to say, I don't know, or I found this number on a web page and I just stuck it in. You're expected to have more rationale than that. You're supposed to have dug into this stuff and be able to explain, well, I went to uh, uh, CNMS and I know that in this area of the country they reimburse X amount of dollars for that for, for a similar product. So I carried that through in my study design and I calculated that out and my study cost $2.3 million. Okay, that's the kind of answer that you have to be able to provide. So these are the sort of resources that will get you there. Okay, so I'm going to try to stick to a half an hour and I'll take any questions. With pulling all this research and stuff, um, what about citations and like crediting the sources? I would keep track of them. I would keep track of a couple of answers. I would keep track of that for yourself, for sure. Um, and we, we're only requiring your executive summary and your slide deck. So it's not like a typical course assignment where we're expecting you, you know, to give me your bibliography. Um, but I would also say don't plagiarize. When you're pulling stuff in, pulling it into, into your executive summary, your slide deck, make sure you give proper attribution. That's just good practice. What else? Come on, it wasn't that bad? No, you're stunned. Are you stunned or are you doing okay? Is that, uh, is that helpful or you have no idea at this point? So how do you incorporate what Mark just presented into your pitch presentation next, not this Friday, but the following Friday? You have no idea. You'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. Like I said, it drives cost. Ask, right? this, this stuff drives cost. Um, well, again, your scientific counterparts on your team are going to be able to help you there. If you look at, it, it, it's, it's a lot of sort of cyber stalking sorts of things. So my best advice, I guess, would be to start with the intellectual property, okay? There will be citations in the intellectual property. There will be other patents. There may be scientific papers. I would pull those um, and I would look at those and see if there's any, in particular, animal testing for safety and efficacy. Um, I would search the inventors, not just in the patent databases, but in the scientific literature, because very often an inventor, especially an academic inventor, and this IP is coming from universities, they are going to be publishing along with their patent. And so they may have published papers on some animal studies. Um, also, within the patent, if you've never looked at a patent, there will be, there should be examples of experiments that they've done, and so there may be some safety efficacy, efficacy testing in there, and you can use that as a model. It may be sufficient to, to satisfy the FDA, and you could just take that data, and you don't have to do that test. Um, so, it's, it's a matter of being, I think, investigative and, and sort of crawling through and, and working from one piece of information to the next. So, start with the IP. Look at the citations that are in there. Look at the inventor. Search for them. Read their papers. Um, and then I would go to something like guidance documents and the guidance for industry from Toxicon, things like that, to look at some of these other tests. And then um, you know, try not to spend too much time digging into the minutia of the tests that are going to be 
quick and cheap because you're going to run into much bigger costs with things like a clinical study versus, you know, some of these toxicity tests might only run a few hundred dollars. You, don't, you guys don't need to grind down on that and spend days and weeks trying to figure that all out to excruciating detail. I, I would move on and focus on some of the bigger cost items like uh, clinical studies. Just to capitalize on that, the other thing related to cost of, of testing is to look at competitors that are in the market. All right, so I'll talk about this in my presentation, but when you, when you look at competitors, most of their information is going to be public. So when you do investigative analysis, you're going to be able to identify how much they spend on, uh, on a specific test on a specific trial, most of the time, depending on it, whether information is public or not. So. Yeah, there, there'll be an interesting solution there between the, the between the science and the business. And again, I wouldn't expect the science students to know this, but the business people ought to expect to know. You should be able to guide them to go into these public documents for the public companies. And and their their, their financial reporting may not be down to the they're not going to tell you what they spend on tax testing product development, but they might have an R and D budget. And and it gets you close. And again, when you're in front of the panel, when you say, well like we, we pulled this, we pulled this uh, you know, the scientific papers of the inventor, and then we looked at some SEC filings, and we sort of merged that together, and that's how we came up with our financial model. That's a much better answer than, I found a number on Google, and I stuck it in there. You know, and you're not gonna get points for doing that stuff. You're gonna get points for thinking and applying. Anything else? I think it's, I think they're all issued, are they not? Um, there's a mixture of um, patent pending and oh, pat pat patent issued. So um, y the answer is in general yes, um, but it's going to be fairly early stage. And, that, and that's where you'll be um, fixing most of your attention in terms of the development of the idea. Yeah, it's certainly going to be early stage. Okay, does that relate to another question? No. Are we good? Okay, one, one thing I neglected to mention. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Does everyone need to stand up for a minute? Yeah, just stretch. Just stretch. Just stretch in place. Take a minute. We'll take yeah. a break, break in the next one. Yeah. Take a minute to stretch for a second before Rob gets going. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forgot the pitch competition uh, slide. It's good though. Oh, right. It's good. You kind of circle back to it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you think John asked your email for. Uh, yeah, for prompting me to uh, think, oh yeah, <laughs> this thing. Did he email you all right? Yeah, he emailed us and I was asking us whether we could publish the prize money or not because he well, said if there's any concern, I was like, no. Publish away. That's one question that I have been getting is, uh, are we doing a first, second, third kind of deal? Yeah. I, so the, 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 the basically oh, four yeah. prizes. There'll be one. The, the last one will be the one that the three of us will choose for the most creative use of IP. This is a good idea. It's sort of less than stretching and some sort of talk amongst each other and trying to figure out what's. Figure out what's going on here. <laughs> All right, guys, let's let's get rolling again. Um, yeah, I, I was just saying to Mark and Derek, this is, you know, apart from being giving you a stretch, it also um, gives you a chance to chat with each other and say, you know, what the heck is going on here? You know, this, is, this, this all seems crazy. Um, one thing I meant to mention in the introductory slides is the pitch competition itself. Um, so here, um, here's its location and uh, date and time. It'll be on November 17th, um, a week Friday, between 2.30 and 6.30 p.m. The location will be here, um, uh, essentially in, there's a lecture theatre above us, you go up to the second or third floor, there'll be entrances up there, it's a 250 seat auditorium, um, so there may be a bit of a crowd, um, I, I know Derek is bussing in 
um, a group of uh, business students um, from from tech. Um, so, um, and most most of you, I guess, will probably be on that bus as well. Um, there'll be four prizes, first, second, and third, which will be judged by the the judging panel. And there'll also be a fourth prize for the most creative use of intellectual property that will be judged by um, the three of us. So, um, um, and we, we have to thank various sponsors, um, including the Apex Centre for Innovation, um, the VTCRI, and, and a couple of local firms, Woods Rogers, and what was the accounting firm? Gosh. Oh, I'm sorry. Pinnacle, Pinnacle yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Pinnacle. Uh, uh, and then finally, um, first string research. The judges, um, um, again, you, you may or may not be familiar with the names up here, um, but they'll be mainly non-academic. These will be people who are actually um, in um, the process of biomedical translation or, or translation of technical ideas or facilitating. For example, Mary is uh, the, the local director of the Regional Acceleration and Mentoring Program. <coughs> Um, which uh, devises a program for um, new startup businesses in the tech sector. And, um, and this is my boss here, uh, Mike Friedlander, um, who insisted that he was on the, the judging panel. In fact, he's the only academic that will be actually present on the panel. No uh, pressure on the TVMA students at that Yes, that's right. And we all know, for those of us who know Mike and know what a dynamo he is, um, he may well be the one asking many of the questions. Um, just to reiterate, um, I'm going to cover most. Uh, yes. Um, you said the things at 2:30 to 7. Six. Th well, the competitions from 2:30 to 6:30, and then there'll be a reception and prize giving after the the event itself. Um, so the TV may students have to be at a medical scholar lunch on Friday from one to two. Uh, yes. So that's why it's at 2:30. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> If you've got if you've got issues with scheduling, let me know. Oh, it's we here. Have, it's, it's yeah, it's here. Okay. It's here. But but there may be other issues, so I'll take this point this time to say that if you've got ske other scheduling issues, let me know. We, I, you know, we haven't set the order of teams yet, so we may be able to accommodate folks in that way. I'm not saying I can, but at least let me know about it. Also, for any of the undergrads, yeah, that is the. Well, that is the beginning of, of Thanksgiving break. And so if you have any family members that are coming down to pick you up or anything like that, and invite them to this. They're more than welcome to attend and cheer you on. So uh, it's a great way to highlight some of your work. All right, so intellectual property is key to a, stick, a tech startup company. Um, and when you're choosing your intellectual property, um, there's various questions that you should ask and debate amongst yourselves including does it solve um, an important problem? Is the market sufficiently large to drive value? Is the intellectual property, the patents around um, the, uh, the idea, um, sufficiently strong to protect your idea and your investor's money? Um, and will it provide enough space in the market to build a business around? Um, um, a term that you may hear um, in your reading on this, um, i.e. provide you freedom to operate. Um, and perhaps um, in this context, um, something of equal importance is, will it be cool to pitch? You know, you're trying to get investors excited about your idea. And so, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that, you know, that I'm going to talk about um, and Marcus started to cover is kind of dry. So you're going to have to figure out ways of making it interesting and not allowing the, um, the coolness of your story to be submerged by um, the details of how it's going to go after it. So, and this is what this slide reflects. Your research and development plan should be um, detailed enough that it gives investors. Um, now, Mark came at it from the, the regulatory angle. I'm, I'm going to sort of tilt the balance a little bit here and start coming at it from the investor angle in terms of the research and development plan. Um, so, you have to give your investors confidence that you're professionals who know what you're doing. But it's not so detailed that the, the call and wow factor gets lost in the weeds. Um, you've only got seven minutes. You know, that's a pretty short time to get a lot of information across. Um, and uh, I think, um, Mark, we, we, the, the link to the videos of other pitching... It'll be up today. Oh, okay. 
Um, Mark has provided a, a bunch of uh, videos of people pitching um, tech ideas, um, uh, biomedical ideas, um, and take a look at some of those because that'll give you some idea as to what works um, in terms of um, making a persuasive um, case for your business. Okay, so, um, and this gets to one of the questions that was just asked. Um, remember that your company will be early stage. Um, these patents are not particularly well developed, um, and so um, developing a research and development plan that goes in detail all the way out to phase three clinical trials is probably not necessary. Um, what you want to be able to do is demonstrate proof of principle to convince your, idea, uh, your investors that your idea has the legs to make it to the point where your business may be acquired by a larger concern, such as a pharma company or a bigger uh, tech company, um, enabling the investor to make a return on their investment. This is another term of art um, used in the startup business, return on investment. Um, and this, um, your research and development plan, as Mark described, will need to meet both regulatory requirements um, and also demonstrate proof of, proof of principle and, and um, efficacy to the investors to think that there's something worth um, putting money into. And just a reminder, um, just in case you think investors um, uh, are most interested in curing cancer or whatever, um, they may be, but mostly they'll be interested in making money back on their investment. So, you know, I know it sounds awful to put it that way, but, you know, this is what it's all about um, as far as the investor is concerned. And, and just a, you know, just a personal perspective, I'm a scientist, um, and, um, you know, um, other scientists may look at me and say, well, why do you do this? You know, what, you know what's the story here? Well, th the reason is that we can make cool discoveries in the laboratory, um, but unless our idea engages this machinery, um, it is very unlikely that our idea will make it outside the laboratory. And that's part of the purpose that, um, you know, I took an interest in this area because this is the one way that science, this is the way that we know works that gets scientific ideas into practice and um, potentially useful and into the market. Okay, so um, as Mark's touched upon, the first step in developing an art, um, research and development plan is to decide um, what your intellectual property is. Is it a medical device, um, a drug, or a, a bio biologic? And also, as Mark has touched upon, um, the research and development for each of these, um, there'll, there'll be different types of data required for regulatory purpose. Um, as well as providing confidence to the investors that the, um, um, the technology has potential for research uh, for return on investment. So generally the time course for the development of a device is shorter than that for a drug or biologic. So that um, probably um, inspires investors because they think they can get a relatively quicker turnaround on their investment. Um, but, you know, um, a drug or a biologic can take 10 to 15 years to make it to the market. But of course, as evidenced by the pharma industry, um, the returns on an important new drug um, um, may be significant. And so um, that also may um, drive the investor's interest. Different types of investors um, specialize in different areas of industry. Um, so um, some people may have more, um, some people and organizations may have more interests in um, 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 devices or certain types of devices, others will um, have more um, um, background in drugs. Mark's already mentioned um, one of these things here, um, a contract research organization. Um, now when you form a company, um, you're not really making a mini university um, generally. You're not sort of setting up um, an administrative unit and then setting up laboratories that sort of run tests and experiments. Most of the experimental work that you will do um, will likely go through a contract research organization such as this one. So um, um, the, the intellectual property that you've been given um, um, has been developed at universities, these tier one universities within Virginia. Um, and as I've mentioned, some companies will do their own R&D, um, but all will use a CRO or a contract research organization um, at some point. So the CROs have the experience and regulatory approval to undertake 
um, what's called good manufacturing practice, GMP production of a drug or device. I know these acronyms are a bit confusing and awful, but you'll come across them um, time and again as, as you um, try and figure out your research and development plan. So, um, you know, salt these into your presentation um, because again, it sort of conveys to the, the it will convey to the judges that um, you know what you're talking about. Um, you'll also need to undertake good laboratory practice tests of safety and efficacy, um, as well as tests of purity, shelf life and toxicity. And Mark um, mentioned um, aspects of these and, uh, and more in his slides, so um, refer to those um, as, as, you, uh, as you develop your plan. And of course, um, clinical trial in humans uh, are generally always undertaken by contract research organisations. Um, now significantly, um, uh, re research and development undertaken by s CROs may improve the investor's confidence um, because they may be already familiar with the CRO and its reputation. Um, they will be assured that the science is carried out and validated by dis interested professional investigators who routinely carry out the same assays. So, you know, um, I hate to say it, but some sometimes scientists get things wrong. Um, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons. Um, you know, um, an investor um, is, is naturally going to be skeptical if he sees a you know, wonderful new idea and he's going to want to know that the data is sound. And um, having it replicated by a, a, an unbiased, disinterested scientific professional is one way of providing um, that kind of reassurance to the investor. Um, they'll also be reassured that a good CRO um, is, is set up to meet regulatory requirements, including documentation, statistics, data retention, and, and also with bigger experiments, um, such as clinical trials, um, which, are, which can be long, expensive, and complex, they'll know that the, um, that the experiment, the clinical trial, will be undertaken by people that have um, experience and understanding of the space that they're working in. Okay. So if you choose a device, you're going to need to tell the judges, i.e. the investors, um, what type of device you're dealing with. So different countries have different regulatory categories, as Mark mentioned, but we're going to focus on the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And they basically divide their uh, categories by um, a risk, um, class one, class two, and class three. So um, class one um, are low risk devices such as surgical gloves and band-aids, etc. Um, there are those associated with moder moderate risk such as a surgical clamp and then higher risk um, devices which you know, may cause a threat to the life of uh, the individual or be necessary for sustaining life. There are various other um, um, uh, reasons behind these categorizations that you can dig into if you want but um, fundamentally um, they're associated with the, uh, the safety and the risk posed to the, the patient. Um, and the other thing is that the, these different devices will determine how much regulatory input you'll need um, from regulatory agencies. So generally, the higher risk categories of medical device will cost you more, will cost your company more. Um, they'll require more testing, more research um, to meet the requirements of the regulatory agency. Um, and they'll also, um, generally with the higher risk um, well, as, as Mark mentioned, um, th they'll require demonstrations of improved effect effectiveness uh, over existing devices um, and demonstrations of safety in human because um, improvement in the standard of care over the existing um, technologies um, is a safety aspect for the FDA. So what would you want to do if you um, had a device um, idea? Um, well, you might want to demonstrate proof of principle. You might want to build and test a prototype. Um, you might like baseline data showing that it meets FDA regulatory controls, is safe and performs uh, better than other similar devices out there. So I'm just going to give you a quick example of one that I made up. There's no such thing as a Gore-Tex Band-Aid, but let's just pretend there is, that uh, one of the inventions is. And the idea will be that it's um, sold over the counter at ph pharmacies for covering uh, minor wounds. Um, and so it's a relatively low risk invention um, it would, which would make it likely a class one medical device. 
And that's the other thing with your interactions with the, uh, the regulatory agencies. Um, they may tell you that actually um, you're not a class one medical device, you're a class two medical device in your conversations with them. So it's a, a negotiation and a conversation as, as, to, as to where you land. So um, you'll need a research and development plan to show data that Gore-Tex Band-Aids are safe and can be produced by good manufacturing pra practice and also the claims that you make about your um, Band-Aid um, can be supported by evidence. For example, um, you may claim that the Gore-Tex Band-Aid allows your wound to breathe, thereby um, encouraging wounds to clo fa close faster. Well, the FDA will require you to back up that claim um, with data. Um, um, I don't know what this evening is doing here, but data showing that, oh okay, even though, <laughs> yeah I, I wrote this last night in a, in a haze of wine and, um, <laughs> and, and, and football, I was, uh, I was watching the, um, the Redskins play and, uh, and uh, it was quite an exciting game so I got distracted every so often. <laughs> so um, yeah, so um, you, you need to demonstrate safety such as that the Gore-Tex Band-Aid doesn't lead to increased wound, inf um, wound infection. Um, and so um, the way to go about this, of course, would be um, experiments um, in, um, in animal models. Um, but also, um, because this is a relatively low-risk um, device, um, you may seek um, uh, an investigation, uh, 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 an IRB, um, um, which is a permission to undertake um, experiments within a hospital setting, say, um, to try out your Band-Aid on minor wounds and abrasions um, and gather data on it. And that would have to be approved by the local IRB board for, for, the, uh, for the hospital. Um, and you may also like to undertake um, research and development um, that shows that, for example, these Band-Aids are easy to store, package, and remain sterile and effective even after long periods on the shelf. So there's stuff that you're going to absolutely have to get because you're making claims about your device, um, but there's stuff, there's other stuff that, um, whoops, that you'll have to um, get because um, you're, you're, you're anticipating that this is the sort of thing that the investors would like to see. So, you, you know, you'll have to, amongst yourself, talk out what you think is necessary to do um, absolutely necessary to do, then other stuff that um, is probably necessary to do, um, you know, given the, the time and cost constraints. Um, a second um, device, um, also made up, um, is a hemostasis bandage, and we could imagine that this might be useful on a battlefield with a wounded soldier, for example, bleeding out. And the idea here is this is a bandage containing a polymer that is activated and rapidly stops bleeding. Um, so let's just assume that the FDA has no pre previous experience with a device like this. Um, and of course uh, um, the device, especially if it fails, will pose a significant risk to the life of the patient. Um, and so the FDA will require you to go through rigorous steps um, to obtain what's called pre-market approval um, um, from the agency before proceeding further. And um, that will involve um, uh, development of um, preclinical experiments, animal studies, um, tox toxicology studies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, and probably clinical trials um, to prove to the FDA that the device is, is safe um, and effective for its in intended use. Um, and investors, as well as the FDA, will need to be persuaded that your hemostasis bandage has a competitive, adva a competitive advantage over their other devices. Um, as to reiterate uh, what Mark says, that it can be made cheaper and faster and works significantly better than competing technologies. Okay, the other path um, that I'll cover briefly is drugs or biologics. So um, this pathway is complex and long, um, but potentially enormously profitable as evidenced by um, the, the size and power of the pharma industry. Um, and as with um, devices, R&D will be necessary to meet both regulatory requirements, um, as well as um, demonstrations of uh, proof of principle and efficacy to help persuade your investors. Um, this is a, a chart that you'll often find um, online. As I mentioned, we're, we're focusing mainly on the early, because we've got early stage um, um, technologies, we'll be focusing mainly on the early stages of this 
um, particular pathway, um, preclinical and perhaps up to phase one clinical trials. Um, you'll need preclinical data demonstrating efficacy of your drug or biologic in a relevant animal model. Um, you'll need this to persuade investors and also to file an IND, an investigational new drug, again as Mark mentioned with the FDA. Um, you'll need preclinical data on the dosing, um, the, re the development of the regimen, i.e. how the drug is applied over time to the, to the subject, um, as well as um, toxicity. Um, and if you're going ahead with a, f a phase one clinical trial, um, does anyone know the main purpose of a phase one clinical trial? Safety. Um, whoops. Um, uh, you, you'll need your detailed plan for that, but also um, some conception for the investors as to what follows in the, the phase two and phase three clinical trials. Um, I was going to go into um, ex an example. How am I doing for time? Two more minutes. Okay, yeah. Okay, so um, th this is a, an example from my own background. I'm, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. Um, uh, this is a company that I started about a decade ago. It's now a clinical stage biotech. It's raised a bunch of money, recently completed a, a Series B round of um, stock offering, um, and has done well. It won a prize that was presented at the White House wasn't presented by President Trump, but by the Small Business Administration officials. So um, this is one of the, the folks at the, the company, uh, Christina, accepting the prize. But it all started with NIH um, basic research. Um, this was our original paper. It was in an ultra um, nerdy cell biological journal in which we first published this compound. Um, and that was back in uh, 2005. Um, but subsequently, um, I had a postdoc join me, Gautam Gatnikar, and you'll be meeting Gautam because he's one of the judges in the competition. Um, I thought Gautam was working on this compound and its effect on cell migration. He thought he was working on this compound and how it affects wound healing. And um, what we discovered is that it sped up the rate at which um, um, uh, skin wounds closed, there he goes, particularly in mice. Um, here you can see a, a wound that's received this peptide. Um, it's a control wound and, and it's undergoing a relatively normal sequence of healing. This is in a mouse. It's an excisional wound, five, millimet five millimeters um, in diameter. And here is the wound that's received this peptide. And what we found was that the peptide sped up the process of wound healing, reduced inflammation, and also reduced the amount of scar tissue associated with the wound. Um, now this was an interesting step. Um, because we started to get excited because we realized that we had something that might be translatable. Um, and at the time, we needed $25,000 to run a study in pigs. Because pigs are, you know, mice are all very well, but many of you have probably heard of the reproducibility crisis in, in a lot of science where pharma companies will get hold of, of data from basic science labs and be unable to reproduce them in the model that they first described them in or um, that they don't apply to larger mo models, animal models of relevance to humans. Um, so in order to convince um, investors, um, we went ahead and tested our drug on pigs. Now, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it wasn't this type of pig. This is the sort of thing you, you come across in the woods of Georgia or perhaps in the forests and mountains of New Zealand, um, a wild boar. Um, but, uh, but they have a skin that's a lot more like humans. Um, even though this guy's pretty hairy, hairy, your average farm pig is relatively hairless. Um, they're taut, like our skin is taut. It, it, it doesn't sag. If you pick up a cat or a dog, you'll notice that they have loose skin. And so, you know, the idea is that it, it models human skin better. And we reproduced the, the same observations that we saw in the mice in the pig model. But that was, a, that was an important step, and it was tough to get the money for that because, he, you know, organizations like the NIH don't like to give out $25,000 um, to do proof of principle studies. And so, you know, this is the type of money that you'll be asking your investors for. Um, that, you know, if we have this, we can take it the next step and we can drive our product forward. Um, and this was the, uh, the time course um, that uh, was followed by first string research. Um, you'll notice some of the acronyms in here, IND, FDA, GMP, Etc. Etc. Um, 
I'll leave the, uh, so we'll be giving these slides out to you later. You can look over these as models of how you might develop your own drugs. And the, the compound is now in a phase three clinical trial. It turns out that it wasn't uh, that uh, while useful in normal wound healing, it also um, appears to have its most um, uh, efficacious benefits in patients with chronic wounds like diabetic foot ulcers and venous leg ulcers, which is um, the focus of the phase three clinical trials. So I'll stop there and let um, Derek pick it up. Um, actually, no, don't clap, don't clap, don't need to. <laughs> I better stop for questions because I, I feel like I'm breathless. Or should I just we, hold? We've got time. We'll take a break too and let everyone use the facilities and stretch again. So questions for Dr. Lori? Yes. How do, you, how do you make this stretch from general wound closure to uh, diabetic? <laughs> so it's an interesting story. Um, so we, um, <laughs> so this happened 10 years ago. We, uh, the MUSC board um, that looked at intellectual property and decided whether they were gonna put money into patents, had a number of very wealthy individuals on it. One of them um, was a local entrepreneur, one of the wealthiest individuals in South Carolina. Um, I won't mention his name because I, I, I may just libel him if I continue to describe what happened next. Um, but um, he, um, he, he was a bit of a genius. Um, he, he saw the potential and he, um, you know, uh, decided that he wanted to buy the intellectual property. Um, but we were adamant that, you know, we wanted to hang on onto it ourselves and develop it ourselves. We had a subsequent meeting with him and he said, well, you know, um, I had some of your peptide made um, in my factory in China and I tested it on some Chinese folks and I also had a, a cousin down in Florida who had a bed sore and I put it on that. And um, it seemed to work. And <laughs> you know, at, at, at this point, it's now, totally illegal, by the way. totally illegal, yeah. <laughs> to totally illegal, yeah. yeah. At, at this point, I was already composing my letter to the, um, to, to um, you know, because I was thinking about my job and losing it. <laughs> Um, to the intellectual property office about how I had not endorsed or encouraged or provided any permission for this illegal poisoning of his relative by our, <laughs> our new and completely uncharacterized drug. Um, but what it did do was it sort of um, opened our apertures a little bit and, and made us start thinking about um, chronic wounds. So that is the unfortunate story of how that, that transition was made. Um, we may have come across it anyway, but um, it certainly spurred it on. Yes. Uh, were you like working while you did all this, or what was the story, like the background story? Of yeah, I so I'm, I I'm I'm not really an entrepreneur. I'm really a, a scientist. Um, the young guy Gautam Gatnikar, um, uh, who was my postdoc at the time, a postdoc is a scientist who's undergoing training in an established laboratory. They've normally already done their doctoral degree, and they're looking to get an academic job or move out into industry. And Gautam was a veterinary surgeon, so he had some clinical background. Um, but also his father was, um, ran a large biotech concern in India that's worth $60 million. And so he kind of had business in his blood. And um, I served as the, the company's chief, chief science officer for the first six months, um, and also on the board for the first two years. Um, but um, my association with the company um, lessened over time, both from the point of view of the fact that it, you know, I didn't want it conflicting with my existing work. Um, but also, I'm not very interested in clinical trials and the kinds of sort of mundane experiments of, you know, killing rats just to find out, you know, what the dose, the maximum dose is of the peptide that they'll tolerate and this sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, I, my, my role in the company was limited to start with and then lessened over time. Uh, actually, that raises an important point. Um, it, um, and, and, and again, it's, it's part of the reason that you're all here. Um, um, often companies will fail because um, one person sort of, you know, thinks that they can do it all. They can do the science, they can do the legal stuff, they can do the business stuff, they can do um, the regulatory stuff. But actually, getting a, um, a good startup company off the ground and moving along requires multiple talents 
and um, inputs from different disciplines. And um, so, uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, we're trying to simulate aspects of that multidisciplinary, you know, collaborative approach um, in, in this course. Yes. If the drug has already gone through the regulatory process in another country, not like what happened in China, but for real, does it get like an easier route? Is there any way to jump kind of into the FDA process later on, or is it still to go the uh, The FDA will certainly take that into account um, as you describe this, you know, as you make the case for, um, you know, why your drug um, requires a faster path to approval versus um, another path. Because you know your, your role as a company is to try and minimize, minimize the costs and the timeline that's associated with the development of the drug to maximize your return on investment to your investors. Um, so um, you know basically, it's it, if you can make that case effectively and um, you know circumvent aspects of the clinical trial process, then um, you know you should consider making that case. Yeah, if it was if it was a trial done in the U.S. And was done through a regulatory body in that country, FDA will generally accept it. They'll look at the quality of it, certainly, the scientific quality of it. If it was done outside a regulatory framework, they will not look at it. Okay. All right. Uh, it's, that, that clock is fast. It's actually 1019. Let's take a five minute break. And then uh, Derek will do his talk, and then we'll have, uh, and then I'll, I'll announce the teams, and we'll get the teams out of it full time at the end to get together before we head back to Black's and those folks. So, five minutes. Try to stick to that, please.
Testing. 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 Cool. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Everyone hear me all right? Great. So my name is Derek McGuire. I'm the uh, executive director for the Apex System Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship here at Virginia Tech. So we help uh, students and graduate students and faculty members uh, start companies. And, uh, and, and I've enjoyed the past couple of months working with Rob and Mark and uh, really excited to be a part of this tv and H program and, and uh, excited to pull together engineers and business students and, and medical students for, for this purpose. Uh, translating a technology or commercializing a technology is, is somewhat challenging, right? And we've already touched on a couple different aspects of the, of the research plan and also the uh, um, you know, the intellectual property and the regulation that, that goes into it. What I'm going to focus on, is, on is, is the business side of things. We're going to talk a lot about a feasibility analysis. And so how do you prepare for the pitch presentation that you guys give next week? And a couple of my points are going to be really geared towards what these judges are going to want to understand on the business side of things. So uh, my slides will be posted. So if I skip over a slide, don't feel like you're missing anything. It's just I'm trying to hit on the high points instead of getting into the weeds. Um, so I want to define entrepreneurship for us, and I think that's important. Um, for me, entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. Okay, so when you think about some of the things that Rob and, and, and Mark were sharing, um, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't control regulation. We don't control, uh, you know, necessarily what markets want or what they need. We don't, we don't control time. Um, we don't control uh, every, uh, our skill set and our knowledge set, right? And I tell my students all the time that in the world of apps and, and mobile technology, uh, a lot of students want to create new companies in that realm, but they don't know computer science and they don't know how to code. So sometimes they have to go out and they have to find a co-founder and, uh, and, and find a partner and build a team so they can, they, they can move that forward. So the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled, I think it's really critical for us to understand. As you go throughout this process, think about you and your team and say, what am I really good at? And what am I not good at? And outsource the things that you're not good at, right? It's gonna be really, really hard for a lot of you to say, you know what, I'm not good at building a financial plan or pro forma. Some of you probably don't even know what that means, right? So give that to the person on your team that, that can do that, right? You may not know all the regulatory issues for, uh, you know, for, for medical and, and, and bio life sciences. Well, if you don't, learn about it, but let the other person on your team that does know about those things, let them lead that, right? And so that's, that's being entrepreneurial, is you know, knowing what you're good at and outsourcing some of the other, some of the other pieces of other people. I want to give a little bit of background. Um, when I, was, uh, when I was 24 years old, um, I, was, uh, I went and lived abroad for a while. So out of high school, I went and lived abroad. I came back, I did some college, I dropped out. And uh, I dropped out to start a company. And that company that I started was a home healthcare company. And so when I was, 20, when I was 23 years old, uh, my grandma, she was in good health. And uh, one day she slipped and fell and she broke her hip and she had to have a hip replacement surgery, which is super invasive and super difficult. And after her surgery, she had to go to a skilled nursing facility or a nursing home, right? Not a pleasant place to be. She hated it there, right? Six weeks later, she passed away. And every time I visited my grandma during that six weeks, all she said to me was, I wanna go home. So I thought to myself, I said, you know what? There's an opportunity here. Why do we build these giant buildings for people that don't want to be there, and we send them to get health care there in, in nursing homes, when we could be taking doctors and nurses and physical therapists and taking them to people's homes. I did some research and found out that 77% of patients actually get better faster and do better in the comfort of their own home. So I started a home health care company. It was an opportunity. 
the timing was right, I had investment, I had the right players, I had the right people, and so I started this company, and I grew it, and I sold it in, in 2010 to another firm. Um, I share that with you because that, to me, is the essence of entrepreneurship, right? Rob talked about some of his experiences, and it's identifying opportunities, and it's also solving a really, really critical problem, right? Um, with home health care, we disrupted the nursing home market just a little bit because we were able to say, you know what, you now have a choice to either stay in your home or go to this nursing home. And people opted for whatever one they wanted to, wanted to do. All right, so feasibility analysis. Okay, it's analysis, the process of determining whether a business idea is viable. Okay, so you're trying to understand, is there a market? Does anyone care about this? Does it solve a problem? Okay? And it's really the preliminary evaluation of a business idea and trying to help you understand, is this worth pursuing? So you get three pieces of intellectual property for this project. You have to determine which one, in a very short period of time, as we mentioned multiple times, which one is the idea worth pursuing. And you have to do that analysis really, really fast. 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> this is really what, what it's going to do. Okay, so a feasibility analysis is going to take you a little while, but it's going to take the guesswork out of a business launch and helps you understand whether or not you should proceed or not. Okay? So the timing of a feasibility analysis is now, right? The proper time to conduct a feasibility analysis early in the thinking through the prospects of a new business. Screen ideas before a lot of resources and time are spent on them. Because right? what happens a lot of times is you see a technology, you, you become enamored with it, and you think it's the best thing since sliced bread, right? I always tell my students that when you build something in your research labs, or you see a piece of technology, or you have a really, really cool innovative idea, that is like giving birth, right? It's like you have a newborn baby in your arms, and you think it is the cutest thing in the world. When in reality, the rest of the world is saying, that baby's ugly. <laughs> I know, it's kind of harsh, right? But honestly, that's a little bit of what happens, right? Is, is you think it's the best thing in the world, and everyone else is like, I don't need that. I don't want that. That's kind of ugly. Ah. Right? And so this takes that out of the equation and, and allows you not to be married to it. It allows you to do the analysis to truly understand just because you think it's a good idea, doesn't mean that the rest of the world does, okay? So an outline, and this is, this is small, but again, it's, it's available for you, and we're gonna go through each one of these parts. The outline for a comprehensive feasibility analysis is to really focus on the product and service feasibility first. Okay, so you're gonna, um, a lot of times that is labeled a technology feasibility. Uh, what that's gonna include is really looking at whether or not there is a, a desirability and a demand for your, for your technology. Industry target market feasibility, so what is the industry attractiveness, target market attractiveness? Your organizational feasibility, I just touched on that a little bit with team and management, so management prowess and resource efficiency. And the resource efficiency, I'll get into this in more in depth, but is not financial resources. It's team, it's lab, it's office space, it's those, those types of things that you have to think about. And then the last piece is the financial feasibility, which when you think of business, everyone's mind automatically goes to that word of, of financials, which we'll definitely do and we'll definitely get into. And I'll be doing a presentation on um, doing break-even analysis and uh, also uh, pre financial projections uh, tomorrow. So I'll, I'll glaze through that pretty quickly. So when we think of product or service desirability, a couple questions that I think are really critical, and if there's anything that you're going to take away from my presentation, I believe it's on this slide, to ask yourself as a team these questions. So over, it, within the next 24 hours, these are the questions that I will be asking with, with my teammates. Does, it, does this make sense? Does this piece of intellectual property make sense? Is it reasonable? Is it something customers need, I'll even slash want, and the consumers get excited about it, right? Does it solve a problem? Does it take advantage of a trend in the industry? Does it fill a gap in the marketplace? OK? 
Okay, for the TVMH students, what's a marketplace? What? Hospitals. Hospitals? Okay. What else? What's a marketplace? Okay, now I'll go to my business students. What's a marketplace? What's a customer segment? So customer segment? Yep. Uh, that is uh, a specific person doing the first Yep. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a corollary with what you said on marketplace with what Paul's saying, right? So a lot of people will say in their presentation, my primary market is hospitals. What are, what are hospitals? Are they people or are they buildings? Are they both? Good. True. <laughs> like that. That's deep. It's deep analysis right there. We have to bring some like rewards to throw people who go really deep like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna ask it again. The people are separate. Right? Because doctors and nurses, janitorial staff, administrative staff, they all work in the hospital, but they all have individual roles. So they're not the hospital. Right? The hospital is the building. So can a building purchase technology or resource? No. There's an individual within the hospital organization that can make those purchasing decisions. I know, mind blown, like, right? Like, there's a CFO who buys things, right? So that, um, that is something that's really important that I want you to focus on. And again, we'll dive deep into it. But in front of judges, what Mark, Rob, and I don't want you to do is be like, hospitals are a market. It's like, no, who within, the mar within that hospital is gonna make that decision? Like, who is that that's gonna buy that, right? A marketplace, you guys can keep it a little bit more broad and, and you could say, you know, this is for pediatrics, um, you know, infants that, uh, that, that, that are within the hospital, right? Like that, that could be a target market. Um, but again, I just wanted to differentiate between customer segment and marketplace. Is this a good time to introduce the product or service uh, to the market? Um, that's really good. That, that's super important in, in timing, right? Uh, Rob just gave his story about uh, about first strings and and the timing of that and how they adapted a technology to serve you know a different purpose than than what it was originally intended for. Um, but if you if you try to attack something and it's not the the, the right time, it's really really difficult. Are there any fatal flaws in the product or service's basic design or concept? You know, probably a little bit more difficult to identify within a drug or a biologic, but probably pretty easy to look at if it's a medical device, right? Is, does this make sense? Would people use crutches that, you know, hook onto their elbows and have pads and whatever it is, right? Like I'm making it up, but you have to think through would that solve a problem of my own and make, make something easier for me to create a market, to create a demand? So you're going to do an assessment of the appeal of the product or service being proposed. Um, you know, two components of product or service feasibility analysis, like I mentioned before, this product service desirability and product service demand. Before all of this, and we'll, we'll go into the desirability and demand, but really developing a business concept is to consider the features and benefits your proposed product or service will offer. And to define that, features are distinctive qualities or characteristics of a product or service. And then benefits are the things that promote or enhance the value of a product or a service to the customer. Sounds super easy, right? Everyone's like, yeah, I know what a feature is. I know what a benefit is kind of difficult in business, right? It's actually really, really important to know the difference between a benefit and a feature. Okay? 
Do the definitions and features and benefits, does that make sense to everyone? Any questions on the difference? Huh? Can you elaborate? <laughs> sure. That's why I'm at, yeah. That's why I wanted to open it up. All right. So I'm going to pick on Glenn, because Glenn helps me with features and benefits. So Glenn, give us an idea of a feature, and you get to pick the product. OK? So pick a product and tell, announce it to the class. Drones. Drones. So not surprised by that choice, all right? So Glenn works with drones, all right? So what are the features of drones? that everything that he's talking about is something on the actual device. Okay? Now, Glenn, tell us what the benefits of a drone are. Ability to take aerial photographs and video. Good. Um, maybe, <coughs> uh, maybe easy to use. Mm -hmm. um, Inspections. Inspections, yeah. Um, versus the aerial perspective. You could throw in a benefit is entertainment, right? To use it for entertainment purposes, right? That's not a feature, that's a benefit of drones. So you see the features are the actual, what it, what it does or what it can do, what's connected to it, the, the device itself and all the different components the benefits are things that help promote the, the value and help you sell it or put it out there. And so you can hear Glenn talk about inspections. If you're selling a drone with a camera to an emergency roadside crew, then the way that you would promote that benefit and the way the camera works on the drone is different than what you do to, say, a family member that's looking to buy their 12-year-old a drone for Christmas. Right? And so the benefits and the features are important. But you do have people that get on the box and they're like, all right, this is a five propeller drone and it's got an eight kilogram battery and it's going to last 19 hours versus this other one, right? Those are features versus features. Okay? Does that help? Yes? So, just to clarify, like, the ability to take pictures is a feature. And then the fact that, that helps you so the feature of that scenario would be the camera and the camera that is on the drone. The benefit would be that you're able to take aerial photographs or monitor a situation from a, a, a distant range. Yeah. So components versus promoting the value. Okay. Really critical, and, and these are nitpicky things, but again, when you think of business, you think of it as like, those people do finances over there, right? Like, it's actually fairly technical, right? There's, there's a lot of things that go into it. Okay, when developing a business con uh, concept, an entrepreneur should ask the following questions, okay? What is the product or service being offered? Who is the customer? What is the benefit that is being provided? How will the benefit be delivered to the customer? These are super critical questions. So I gave you the questions before to help you analyze the intellectual property that you'll have, right, and help you make that initial decision. Once you've made that decision, these are some of the core questions that you have to hunker down on almost immediately, right? And then you start doing research on each one of these to really identify who is the customer, benefits that are provided, and then how will the benefits be delivered to the customer? What do I mean by that bottom question? How will the benefit be delivered to the customer? It is a value proposition, yes. But what does, does that mean? Could be your marketing strategy. Could be part of your marketing strategy, absolutely. How you convey it. Yep. Um, in case of like a drug, it would be like 
interacting with doctors to help them quickly try those patients or know when to give those patients? Yep, good. Again, looping that in with marketing strategy. Also knowing your channel partners. So if a doctor has to prescribe a drug, they're, they're a channel of how that's going to be delivered, right? If it's going to be on the shelf, a channel partner might be, how do you get in front of CVS so that they sell your product versus another product, right? If it's a medical device, going to a medical device company, and how do you build those relationships and those partnerships? And, and a lot of times in business, you refer to those as channel partners, right? So how is, how is a, a benefit and product you know, delivered, okay? Again, for all the TBMA students, you guys are, uh, you keep asking questions and, and, and make sure you guys are getting clarification on this. All right, so the product service demand. Step one, administer a buying intention survey, an instrument that is used to gauge customer interest in a product or service. It's gonna be hard in the period of time that you have, and I don't know if you'll even be able to do it but I'm teaching you and trying to help you understand the instruments of what it would take to take something to market. So if you had a drug and your hypothesis was that you were gonna give that to doctors to, sp to prescribe to their patients, you would probably wanna build a survey and understand what the doctors are looking for and help them help you understand what the features and benefits of that drug are, right? Medical device, same thing. You're, you're constructing a survey to understand, are you solving a problem? And is your product marketable? And will that audience market and sell it for you? Or buy it from you, okay? Okay, we're gonna conduct library and internet uh, research. Really, I think this is where most of your time is gonna be spent for this project. Um, lots of really, really great tools. Um, Virginia Tech has a library full of companies um, that are all along their, their growth trajectory. So companies that are early stage, all the way to IPO. Um, lots of competitive analysis that you can use. So we have a lot of uh, different resources that Mark will post um, for, you to, for you to use those um, and, and look into those. But that, that is going to be where majority of your information is going to come from. But I'd be remiss to, tell you, to not tell you about that, because that, to me, is primary goal number one. And then eventually, uh, you have usability testing. This absolutely connects to, um, you know, to what a lot of TVMH students are doing in, in labs, right? So you're, you're testing things, and you have to do field trials or focus groups, user tests, beta tests. All of those things are adaptable to any industry or market, whether it's data analytics, software as a service, or you know, health and life sciences. Um, so those are really your three steps to understand the demand of it. Um, with these usability testing, you're really getting in front of the users and testing it and helping them, you know, again, they're telling you, oh, I'd do anything to have that. I would love to have that. Right? That's the kind of response that you want from, uh, from potential users. Okay, so then when you break into the industry and target market feasibility analysis, you're doing an assessment of the overall appeal of the industry and the target market for the proposed business. And to define an industry, group of firms producing a similar product or service. Right? Medical device industry, huge. Pharmaceutical industry, huge. Now within those industries, there are sub-industries. Right? So you can, you can pick one out. Um, you know, one could be uh, medical records for, you know, medical equipment, right? There's software that connects different computers and servers and the translation of data is, is made possible. Then there is um, orthopedic uh, medical devices that could be a sub-industry within the larger industry as a whole. I would really hope, and Mark and Rob can correct me here, I would like to see each group get into at least a sub-industry uh, focus for their presentations, meaning that you're driving down to that second layer. Um, so instead of being like, our industry is pharmaceuticals, great. You know, what, what pharmaceutical sub-industry are you in? Do you guys agree with that? 
Yeah, I, I mean, if not, you're going to say your your market is you know I don't even know a trillion something dollars for pharmaceuticals, um, and that's just not going to be realistic, right? You need to get really, really close and focused on on your sub industries, and then a firm's target market is the limited portion of the industry um, that it plans to go after, right? So. That target market is going to be critical, and that will be absolutely one of the questions that the judges are going to want to see. Who are you trying to serve? Industry market feasibility analysis, industry attractiveness, market timeliness, and identification of a niche market. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but my slides will be posted so you guys can dive into that a little bit more. Um, but these three components are pretty, pretty critical. And you know, again, Rob was kind of touching on this with his story. Um, of, of how they were able to, to really create, uh, identify and create a, a, a niche market. So I'll squeeze through here. Well, let me, let me actually breeze through these. The characteristics of, of attractive industries. Um, make sure you hit this slide and just look at it. A lot of people think that, oh, I'm, I'm totally disrupting an industry by creating, industry young or old um, where are other firms in their life cycle are they early are they new so you'll do research on different firms that are that are in that market timeliness a lot of you've heard of like first mover advantage um, companies that, that enter the market first or second so we'll use Facebook as an example was Facebook the first social network no, for all of you that are as old as I am, what, what was one of the first? Friendster. Friendster, yeah, who said that? That's awesome, dude. Yes. Rarely do I get someone that knows about Friendster, so thanks. Appreciate you being here. Um, all right, so Friendster, MySpace, there are probably about 20 different others, right, that, that didn't make it as big. And so Facebook was not the first, first mover. Like so many entrepreneurs, it, 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 this is one of my biggest pet peeves. Like, well, someone's already doing that. I'm not going to do it anymore. Why is that a bad thing, and why does that drive me crazy? What does it show you if someone else is already doing it? It's a viable idea, right? So what it might be is, and we use Glenn's example, it might be that the features of their drone are so specific to a market that it doesn't appeal to the rest of the market. So the rest of the market is 10 million people and the, this drone company is servicing a million. So you look at it and you're like, oh, I'm not going to make another drone company because this company's already doing it. They're crushing it. They're doing a great job. Well, really, there's nine more million people that want to get in, that want you to get in the market to serve a specific value, whether it's a feature or benefit, to them. Right? So imitation, in my opinion, is one of the best forms of flattery, right? So just because someone else is already doing it doesn't mean that you shouldn't enter market, right? So think about think about how you guys can uh, how you guys can can take the existing industry and companies that are in that industry and do something just slightly different and how that would help you capture market. It has to be a compelling case. Right? Um, but this talks about first mover. Disadvantages of being first, again, we won't view it. And then second mover, um, most of this is like reducing risk and then uh, reducing the cost associated with R&D. So you heard um, you know, Mark talking about regulation. A lot of your analysis can be done with folks that have already been in that industry. So a competitive analysis, going to competition of people that are already in the market doing this is super, super important. All right, organizational feasibility. Um, looking at whether or not the business has sufficient skills and resources to bring a, a, a specific product to market. This is the number one cause of companies' failure. Everyone says it is lack of capital or market wasn't ready. It's all a lie. 
It's all about the team and whether or not they can execute. So something that you'll want to say to the judges after you've worked a whole 10 days together as a team is to say, you know what? We have an engineer, we have a business student, and we have a medical student on our team. But we realize that we need an industrial designer because our medical device really needs to be redesigned and engineered to do these things. And if we win this competition, we may use the funds to do that. Okay. Or this data analytics platform, we need a data scientist to come help us build this out so that we can So this, this is super, super important. Again, focus on the non-financial resources. And I'll focus on these two primary issues to consider. Management prowess, okay? So two of the most important factors in management prowess is the passion that the solo entrepreneur or the founding team has for the business idea. Um, how many of you think I was really, really passionate about home health care when I was 23 years old? I wasn't at all. Not, not even the slightest. Not even the slightest. Right? I ran that company for three years, and then I hired a professional CEO to come in and run for me because I was just like, I cannot do this. And you know why? One of the main reasons is what Mark touched on in the first lecture, part of the lecture. Regulation. What was happening in the mid 2000s when I started my company? Healthcare was going through crazy changes. I couldn't put together a financial projection for the life of me. Three times in my first year, I had to put my entire staff's payroll on my credit card. Not fun. I promise you that, right? But people need healthcare. So it was a very certain market, right? There, there's absolutely a demand for what we were offering. But I wasn't passionate about it. And so when I hired my CEO to come in and replace me, and I was able to take a, a board seat with the company, that was one of the best days of my life. Because I still owned the company, and I was still able to operate, and I knew how it was doing, but I didn't have a day-to-day -day role. So when you think about this, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily apply to this project, but for, for a broader scale, think about how passionate you are about something. And if you're not passionate about it, it's going to be really difficult for you to be successful. It has to be something that you really, really care about. And then you have to think about the extent to which the sole entrepreneur or the founding team understands the markets in which the firm will participate. <clears throat> I knew nothing about home health care. I knew nothing about Medicare. I knew nothing about Medicaid. I knew nothing about insurance. And I entered the market with home health care thinking that I was just going to all of a sudden be able to deliver healthcare in people's homes and I'm making money and be rich and doing that, right? Guess what happened? And guess why I had to put my team's payroll on my credit card three times? Medicare certification for home health care agencies in Arizona at the time was 18 months. Right? I didn't know. So I went in there thinking, like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to solve this problem. I know nothing about the industry. But what I did do is I hired really, really smart people around me that knew the industry, hired consultants, and they came in, and we wrote letters to senators, to congressmen, to governors, and that 18 months was, was dwindled down to just a couple of months. And so you have to... You, you have to really understand the market or surround yourself with people that do to, to, to be successful. Resource, resource efficiency, um, you know, again, focus on the non-financial, non but do you have the sufficient resources to launch the proposed venture? So something that, that our judges are gonna wanna hear next week is if, if you were to really translate this and take this to market, what would you need? Would you need a lab? Would you need office space? Would you need testing? What, what, what would you need? Would you need more team members to help you with these things? Right? That's the kind of stuff that we want to see you begin to build out and begin to forecast so that people understand um, you know, what, 
what it would look like if you were to take this to market. Um, so again, you should think about you know six to twelve most critical non-financial resources that will be needed to move the business idea forward. And anything more than that is getting into the weeds. So keep it high level. Uh, again, I have some resources for you here. You guys can look through this on your own time. Um, but example, affordable office or lab space, quality of labor pool available. You're going to launch a, um, uh, you know, uh, a healthcare firm in uh, Pace in Arizona, where the labor pool is very much zero. Uh, there would be pretty difficult for you to be successful, right? Um, what's happening in Silicon Valley is the quality of the labor pool is high. But the costs are so high there right now that people want to leave. So you see places like Southern California and San Diego, Phoenix, Arizona, LA, growing like crazy with new uh, technology firms because it's cheaper to live there. It is so you have to think about these, these decisions and these, these, uh, these opportunities. Luckily, we're in Rutherford Blacksburg, which is like heaven on earth. So, at least in my opinion. All right, financial feasibility. This really focuses on the aspect of what cash you need up front, what the financial performance is of, of similar businesses, and then the overall attractiveness of, of the proposed uh, venture. Rob touched on this as well. All right, what is it, what is the return on investment that you could make? If we had one of our judges stand up and say, I love that idea, here's a million dollars, what would you do? and how would you return that person's investment? Right, that's the kind of stuff that you need to think about when you think about financial feasibility. I'm not going to go into depth with this because, again, I'll touch on it tomorrow. But those are the four components that you need to hit on um, you know, pretty deep on your, on your pitch is you know, looking at the organization feasibility, the market feasibility, product or service feasibility, and then the financial feasibility. I'll stop there and answer your questions. Everyone knows how to run a business now? That's what I'm talking about. Okay. No questions? got the part that everybody's been waiting for. <laughs> the team assignments. Um, so what we're going to do is I'll put up the, uh, the team compositions and we'd like for you to give you guys um, a little bit of time. We won't uh, take off for Blacksburg. I think the battery died on that while you're talking. It did die. Uh, yeah. You might be able to get a few. Um, to give you guys a little bit of time to uh, talk amongst your team before we head back to Blacksburg with the vans. So let me plug this in and see if I can pull this up. Um, and what we'll do is, everybody take a quick peek. And um, I couldn't fit it all the teams on one slide, so I've got two slides, OK? So I'll, I'll sort of flash back and forth between these two. Uh, just a couple things. For purposes of the competition, we want you to make it as realistic a simulation as possible. Pick a name for your company. Pick a name for your product. If I were on your team, I'd probably search the U.S. Patent Trademark Office for a trademark infringement, because you might get that question. Who knows? But pick a, pick a company name. Pick a team name. Don't use Team 1, Team 2, and Team 3. Okay, This is just for organizational purposes. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have Team one, meet in the corner. Team two, halfway down. Team three, team four, team five, team six, team seven by the Oprah chairs. <laughs> team eight over here, okay? Everybody got that? Team one, team two, team three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hang on, a couple, couple things that you should think about doing, right? Exchanging information. You guys are going to need to communicate. There's like team eight. Crazy. 
right? And then maybe a designation of some tasks that you want each member to start looking at. Now, it is 1107. So somebody do me a favor who's still got their computer open and check Canvas and make sure that you can see a new document that has team and IP assignments that came through. OK. OK. So this same information is up on Canvas now. So you can see your team members. And importantly, the links to your IP is th are there. If the links don't work, let me know. Okay, but it's an Excel spreadsheet on Canvas that you should be able to pull down and get your team members and your IP. So let's kind of break up into teams because I also want to reassign Van.